Yo, it's the freaking Frack Show, a podcast for the fans. By this the is fans. the freaking Frack Show, a podcast for the, for fans, the fans. By, by the, the fans. fans. Freaking Frack Show, a podcast for the fans. By the fans. All right, guys, you're watching the freaking Frack Show podcast for the fans. for the fans. By the fans. Well, I love you. I'm man. What's up, man? Dude, uh, got a crazy, crazy week ahead of us for uh, the freaking frack show. Starting off this uh, Tuesday, which they'll be watching next week. Next mm-hmm. week, uh, off to a rip roaring start, man. This thing's gonna be. This thing's gonna be crazy. I'm excited. Seems like we're uh, we're getting uh, busier and busier with this podcast, man. <laughs> These are good problems to have. These are good problems to yeah. have. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, how was your Thanksgiving? Uh, Thanksgiving was pretty good, man. Um, I mean, I, it was actually pretty, it was okay. Uh, but like, uh, the entire time I was just eating different things and I was like, yeah, I shouldn't be eating this, you know? And, <laughs> um, so yeah, now I'm back to a keto self and, uh, we're not going to go to New York. We're going to stay here with precious and, uh, be with her through, through, throughout her, you know, the remaining time she has left. So um yeah so that means no more cheat dates for me <laughs> oh man thanksgiving is just one of those times you know it's it's we we had 67 people over at my grandma's house it was insane nope. it was insane it was nope. uh it was the last one there and we were uh you know we made it worth it so uh anyways i guess without further ado for episode 69 this week we have our friend amina kaplan what's happening Woo! I don't know the button. There's just like a clap. Let me see. Nope. Hey guys. Oh, nope. not no. Nope. 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 There was so, we'll there was so much in that intro. 67 people at your grandmother's house. That's amazing. <laughs> you Crazy. said it was the last time, so I guess she's passing the torch this time around. That was amazing. Wow. And then I'm on episode 69, which I think is also pretty funny. <laughs> you could go with like the yin to the yang. I mean, there, there's a different way. Now that you can go. I like yin, yin, yin and yang is is the symbol for the ages that I like the the yin and yang, man, that thing was hot back in the day. Now that I'm thinking back to it, like, you know, I still swear by yin and yang. I still swear by, I I think that is the Dallas had it on the money with that. We, we drove right into the philosophical deep end. Didn't we gentlemen? I mean, right off the bat, we, we didn't even like (laughs) tiptoe up to the edge. We were just like hitting it straight. We just jumped. Let's go. Why not? gonna be hard to follow <laughs> uh amina i want to talk about back before you got your well i mean it, the list i i looked it up earlier and it might be hard to to go back before you know you can remember wanting to be an, an actress or an actor but i mean i see credits back to 95 let's go back before mm-hmm. that and uh where are you from and and kind of what makes you 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 know well i'm definitely repping the atl you know i'm i grew up in atlanta Um, But I did spend most of my life in L.A., you know, just in the business or whatever. But but I grew up in Atlanta. So that's definitely my hometown. I went to performing arts high school there, Um, went to the same school as Stacey Abrams went to that um, (laughs) Omar, you know, from um, Queen Sugar went to and um, Doreen Missick. Like there's a whole bunch of people from that school that are working. Kelsey Scott, like who's an Emmy nominee from The Walking Dead and just like. You know, just a whole bunch of kids came out of that school. We were all very serious about the arts and obviously public service. And uh, so, yeah, I've just been kind of doing this since I was a kid. And my first job, you're right, was uh, was actually 94. I booked Stomp and uh, I was 19 years old and I've been working professionally ever since. But before that, the performing <laughs> arts high school, you know, we were doing we were doing our own shows. We had a very high quality school and um and before that, I was just a little wannabe. I was like a little break dancer. I was trying to be a B-girl. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely, you know, I had that cardboard. And I, you know, I used to be able to do some some floor rock stuff. Like, Ooh. I was I was like, you know, yeah, I could spin. And so I could still spin and back spin and all that kind of stuff. And hand spins wow. and head spins and stuff. Yeah, I used to be into that kind of stuff. And um, never really 
had formal dance training. I had a little bit when I was like 10 years old and then I started seriously when I was like 14, but by then it was too late for a girl to have a, a career in Alvin Ailey as it were. So I found other al alternative forms of movement and yeah, made it, made a career of it and making a career of it. And th this is the third guest in a row uh, for us that, that I would put, and I think you guys would as well put in the entertainer, category not and not like pigeonholed as like an an actress or, or a mm -hmm. singer or a dancer i mean and that's just crazy to me I, I was i was thinking about it the other day we are truly like uh derived like from who we are from our culture and, and our upbringing and and that's what makes us us and and it's just so crazy to think about you know it, going left instead of right where we could be now and you know who we might be it's yeah. but as as far as the dancing goes the furthest i got was the worm that that's what I can do. <laughs> I used to do worm. I forgot about that. <laughs> I can't, I can't even let do me, it. Let me ask you a question. Could you do it from standing? Like you would stand up and then you just hit the deck and then that's the only the way to do it. I mean, you're nope. busting out in an eighth grade dance. You're not yeah. going to start on the ground and rock back and forth. No, no, I mean, you, you got to go from standing. We were, we were much shorter then, though. I was much closer that's true. to the ground when I was trying. And so, but oh my God, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the worm. I used to do all that stuff. It was really. I still love. I still love b boy and b girl, and like I love breaking. I think it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but this from this side of it now, like I've directed um, a show that had b boy in it, and I've got, actually oh, I've worked on a cool. couple of shows that had b boy in them. And I just, I love dance as just you know in all its forms. Um, but I do tend to work with like urban dance. I'm, I co-wrote a show right now that's starring Lil Buck out of memphis and memphis jooking and wow. um so i mean i'm I, I love it i love any kind of material that's working with urban dance like that um but yeah i haven't um done any serious b-girl and since i was like 10 years old which is like <laughs> 1985 or something. oh <laughs> man so you, you said you were uh you were born and raised in atlanta uh, I have a lot of ties there myself. Um, I actually lived there for uh, about four four years, um, just a few years ago, and uh, it's one of my absolute most favorite places in the world. I know it sounds crazy, but I, I've actually traveled the United States, pretty much most states I've been been through and been to, and uh, but Atlanta was always a place I would always go back to. You know, yeah. and, um, it's just what, I don't know. The, what the, did you like about it? Uh, personally, I, I really, I really like the people, mm. you know, I, I was there, uh, I, I lived in the, uh, old fourth ward, um, and, uh, um, it was next to the, uh, was it the belt line and, yeah. uh, literally like a block away. And, uh, I don't know, just always being out there, just always seeing the, the culture. Um, you know, I live in Louisiana where they say Southern hospitality is here, but, I don't know. Atlanta kind of beats them, uh, beats the cake with that because uh, yeah. I don't know. People are different. People are very, very. I, I mean, I thought they were very nice, and the food was pretty awesome. <laughs> I think Atlanta is very nice. I think Atlanta definitely has that southern hospitality thing for sure. Yeah. Like I carry it with me. I just wanted to correct one thing you said, Frack, which is that I wasn't born in Atlanta. I was actually born in Denver, Colorado. Um, but, ah. but I moved to Atlanta when I was like five or six years old, so that is my hometown. Yeah, it's your first but, memory. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, that's where, you know, that's where my childhood was. Oh, yeah. But yeah, Atlanta has changed so much. You know, I moved there, I think in 1980, I want to say my family moved to Atlanta. Wow. And like I say, I was five or six years old at the time. And um, it was a very different city than when I graduated high school in 1992. And uh, it, it, at, the, at that point, the Olympics hadn't come. Freaknik had just started. You know, wow. the hip hop community was really just starting to take off, like Goody Mob and all those cats were yeah. really just starting to get together. And, you know, I mean, they were together before, I'm sure. It's, they'd be like, I mean, we, you know, but like, <laughs> my knowledge, you know, they, yeah. I didn't know who they were. Yeah. Um, until like the mid 90s or whatever. But so Atlanta was just starting to pop off. And, and I kind of made my, um, I guess, transition into adulthood in New York City. I went to Tisch School of the Arts. Wow. So New York for, it still really is a very special city to me, but for a long Definitely. time, I considered it my second home. It was, that was where I really came of age. That was where it was like, okay, what kind of artist am I going to be? What kind mm. of career am I going to go after? You know, what, what lane am I going to get in? That happened in New York. So did my politics, like, you know, um, 
just be realizing who I was as a young woman and just realizing, wow. you know, just all, all that kind of stuff. New York was very, very influential with that. Like just realizing that, you know, art and people matter to me more than money and politics, like that kind of stuff, you know, Yeah, that all happened in New York. That's so fast paced up there. Like every time we go up and I, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to keep up there. It's not like a, like you don't want to be a tourist sitting there looking at up at the sky, you know, like pretending yeah. like I want to live here so bad and be a part of it, <laughs> be a part of the city. And then people are just passing me by saying, get out of my way. I've got places to be. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you yeah. talked about kind of that shaping you. I mean, that's you know, it didn't feel like that to me. It didn't feel like that to me. Like, you know, as soon as I got there, it felt like a glove. You yeah, know, and I had, I had visited there, you know, a couple years before with the high school group. We went up there because I think they were trying to inspire us at the performing arts high school. So we went up there, you know, and I remember being in the city being like, I cannot wait to live here. And I mean, I turned 18, June 17, 1992. And I mean, two months later, I was in New York living and it wow. took a lot to get me to come home. Yeah. So New York to me felt like a glove. Like as soon as I was in the city, I immediately, you know, started making local friends and I, I was at the club, you know, I was getting <laughs> into the club thing at that time. We were young and just kind of 18. And they, at that time, they liked underage people in the clubs. This is don't do this at home. But, <laughs> but this is what it was, you know, in New York, it's yeah. like if you were 18, it wasn't necessarily because you were cute. It was because you were 18 and they yeah. would pull you right out of the line and pull you. And so I just remember clubbing and the music and house music was really what we were into so new york to me and then the freedom you know i yeah. was definitely my you know freak flag was flying i had no <laughs> idea how odd or off the beaten path i was because i'd come from such a mainstream environment down in the south like a really sort of yeah. mainstream environment mainstream musical theater and mainstream black folk mainstream you know and um, I, I was kind of an oddball and didn't realize how much of an oddball until probably like two weeks ago. But New York <laughs> made me feel like I belonged there. I didn't feel like an oddball in New York. I don't think it was until I got to L.A. when I was like, oh, you're right. Remember in high school, you were weird. You're weird again in L.A. <laughs> but in New York, I felt I felt beautiful. I felt, yeah. like, you know, empowered. I felt seen. I felt like challenged i felt like all these great so the, that city really worked for me now i i wouldn't live there now unless you know i had like just let's just i mean i'm just gonna be honest like you just need mad money to live in new york oh you gotta be balling it's crazy yeah yep. the way that i want to live and you know <laughs> yep. it's like you can't live that way unless you're just you know and then there's whole parts of me that feel some type of way about the amount of money that you pay for the space that you get. Oh you know? yeah. That's, yeah. So I just whole parts of me just feel some type of way about that. And I've managed to make a career outside of New York and go back and forth and work. So I was just there with Lion King a couple months ago, loving it. Just oh. loving it. The more I'm there, the more I love it. The more I'm mm -hmm. immersed in the city and in my groove and doing my thing, but you have to have a job. And if you don't have a job, <laughs> New York is a lot less fun. So in my opinion. It, yeah. It's definitely true. I've been been in New York uh, I think five times now in the last six years. And uh it's you know what I usually do is rent rent an uh Airbnb. Uh I always find like just the craziest deals with Airbnbs every time. And I remember going to New York the first time ever. Uh I didn't tell anybody I was going. I left uh you know Louisiana and got on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> like like this is like overnight. I was like Okay, I'm gonna go to New York. So I left the next day, and while on the bus, I booked the Airbnb. It was like 200 and I don't know, 240 bucks for like nine days, eight or nine days in the Bronx. Wow. <laughs> um, and uh, just had the time of my life there. I, I had a, a lot of similar feeling uh, with feeling free, uh, feeling yeah. like uh, there was so much stuff back home that wasn't here you know, in this moment and who I am right now, it's just, you know, it was like a kind of like a, a refresh for me, you know, and uh, I love New York. I love Broadway. I'm a huge Broadway freak. I am, a, you know, my girlfriend and I see every show. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a it's a 
you know, they say it's a beautiful city, but it's also a little trashy at times, you know, depending where you oh, go. <laughs> especially if you're hanging out in Times Square. Like, Ugh. that's that's one of the things I, that just bothers me is that yep. that's the welcome mat for so many people that come to New York. And it's just the blindfold, like, yeah. right? Oh, my God. Yeah. And you just don't yeah. see it. And then people take home that that idea about New York that it's like yes. Times Square. And if you if you don't venture out of there, you know, it can I can see how people come there and they just hang out in Times Square and they see shows and then maybe they make it to a museum or whatever. But they, yeah. they got the hotel in Times Square and they think that's New York and they're out there and the, the city just exhausts you in that, like, you know, one mile square radius or whatever it is. That, <laughs> it's the so city small. Exhausts you. Oh, my God. And just all the elements and everything that's going on there, just from the hyper tourism of it to all yeah. the people that are there to take advantage of the tourists, you know, oh, but if, yeah. you're, if you're from New York, you live in New York, you just, you, you don't you go buy, there. Yeah. And then, you know, working on Broadway, it's a, it's a strange feeling because it's a, uh, you, you know, you have to walk through the muck in order to get to the theater. Wow. And as yep. soon as you get to the theater, it's like, Oh, you know, this oasis, <laughs> but I, I am just not a fan of Times Square the way that I was when I was 18 and used to think it was so crazy. But when I was 18, Times Square didn't look like that. Times Square was like a bunch of movie theaters where you could see crazy, you know? Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Arcades. There were arcades <laughs> and stuff like that. And like, yeah, but it didn't, it didn't really, it wasn't sort of, you know, so bun, da, dun, da, dun, dun, like it yeah. is now. And, <laughs> but yeah, you got to go to the other parts of New York. You, you do. Just, you have to. You otherwise, do. You're, you don't really experience New York properly if you just I see Times Square. I tell people that all the time, you know, uh, when they tell me, oh, I went to New York and I was and there, I saw the Statue of Liberty. I went to see a Broadway show. I was like, did you go to Soho? And yeah. They're like, I'm like, they're like, no. I'm like, did you go, you know, pass through Little Italy? And did yeah. you see where there's like, you know, go to Chinatown where there's cats hanging, hanging dead? And they're like fifty dollars, you know, Dude, <laughs> I'm like, Chinatown you didn't see anything. I, I love Chinatown, yeah. too. Yeah. The, the steam buns, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty major. Yeah, I mean, you just kind of have to get into it, you know. You kind of yeah. have to like tell the tourist group you'll see them later and yeah. go exploring, and you will find awesomeness in New York. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's so many areas, like you know, the stuff that you're naming. But I'm just thinking about you know all the places I used to rock with. And just, mm -hmm. You know, just there's just so many neighborhoods. I haven't oh, lived there, there in so many years that. Um, I can't say that I know what the hot spots are anymore. I just know the hot spot is not Times Square. It changes. It yeah, changes it though. Does. Fine. Yeah. 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 When I was there, it was Lower East Side. We were, you know, yeah. a lot of, a lot of, you know, in the um, late nineties and stuff, it was Lower East Side was really popping. And so was um, Park Slope was popping, but it had already become yeah. pretty gentrified and it was getting pushed out like Fort Greene and, wow. you know, other areas of Brooklyn were were more kind of where where the people were hanging out as opposed to you know Park Slope had just gotten so expensive you couldn't you couldn't enjoy it anymore so you know um, I had a friend who lived way out in Red Hook I wonder if he still lives there actually it's a little distance <laughs> yeah Red, I think Red Hook is as far as you can go and still say you're in New York you know wow we you know? uh you know me and my girlfriend we we actually uh she she went on a work trip. And I was like, okay, I'll just follow you and I'll just say, I'll go like four or five days beforehand. That way I'm there for like two weeks. And uh, I remember finding this amazing Philly, uh, like literally Philly cheesesteak place um, called uh, Rockies in Queens. And it's like this big stand and they've been there for, they said like 43, maybe, maybe 50 years now. And it's in a like um, big lots, uh, like parking lot. And they've been there for like 40 years, the same location. He's got like two other locations in, in Philly. And I'm telling you, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm from Louisiana. This is my first uh, Philly cheesesteak. And he's like, <laughs> welcome. And he's like, yeah. hold on. He's like, what He's like, what you like What you like in your sandwich? And we were like, oh, you know, just whatever comes on it. He's like, all right, y'all want small or large? I said, oh, let's go with a, a large for me and small for them. And uh he ended up getting everybody larges and he was like, We don't want your money. Welcome. Oh, he's awesome. like, he's like, try how, this. How was the sandwich? <sighs> Truthfully, I've been disappointed with every single sandwich today since then. <laughs> 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 That's been about probably three years, man. It's it's been about three years since I've had that sandwich. And we we're supposed to go uh, next week actually back to New York. And uh 
my dog isn't doing too well. So we're actually going to hold off until January. But uh, I literally Facebook messaged him the other day and said, hey, I'm not going to be there next week, but we'll be there in about four or five weeks, maybe. <laughs> I hear that. You got You get your spot. I enjoy that, too. There's the, oh. the mom and pop spot. That's what keeps me, yeah. keeps me sane, for sure. For sure. <laughs> so you, you said you moved to New York in 92, right? Yeah. And then, and then you had booked your, your first, uh, your first shot in 94. I mean, what happened between then and then? Well, I was in school. I was at Tisch School of the Arts. I was at the Experimental Theater Wing. And like I was saying, I come from pretty traditional musical theater and I wasn't very good at it, but that's just what I come wow. from. And I think I got to Tisch and Arthur Barto, the, um, uh, I guess it would be the Dean. Uh, I think he saw that. I was not going to have a very successful mainstream <laughs> musical wow. theater career. And mm -hmm. he, he asked me what studio I wanted to be in. I said, Stella Adler, which is like a very classical sort of, you know, acting training, very upright, you know, kind of acting training. And uh, he was like, no, I think you need experimental theater. And I was like, okay, I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> and I got in there and basically had my mind blown by these, um, what were at the time experimental techniques, but you know, 25 years later, I see these techniques used all over the place, all over the place, in particular in the dance world, uh, because our student, our studio was movement based. Like the idea was that your body was your instrument. And so we trained a lot with our body, you know, what is your, what is your body and how do you move it? So we did mm. kinesthetic awareness and we did Alexander Technique and Alan Wayne work in Bouteau and contact improv and yoga and, you know, all the kind of, you know, far out there movement techniques and plastiques and just all this crazy stuff that we did that was all body centric. And um, my freshman year was amazing and mind blowing. And then my sophomore <laughs> year, I was frustrated and bit of a cut up in class and was definitely spending some time at the clubs and found myself waking up on the studio floor. <laughs> going, Where are we? <laughs> I just wasn't as, um, as focused on it as I needed to be in order to succeed at that level, at that kind of university. Um, I also think I was struggling with just understanding what the training was about. It was very experimental, yeah. as you say, and um, I just didn't get it. So stomp, came along and they had the, the original British company had just come to New York and they were looking for an American replacement cast so that they could, I guess, like um, test the show out in America. So they had this limited tour. So they wanted to hire a new cast for America. And a friend of mine saw a flyer that said, uh, Stomp, it's a new percussion show from Britain and they're looking for drummers who like to jump around and dancers who like to beat on things. And my buddy like grabbed the flyer and handed it to me and goes, this is you, this is you. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay. And so I just went down there in my little cutoff shorts and little baby t-shirt and combat boots and, and, and booked it um, wow. out of youthful naivete. And I think also at that moment, I was exactly what Stomp was looking for. Yeah, you know, I just I just fit the mold of what Stomp was, and it gave me a career, and it was a part of what I what I now call the physical theater revolution that happened in the early '90s with Stomp, Blue Man Group, Cirque du Soleil. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that whole collective of us that were making shows that were physical, physically based. They were up close magic. They gave you something that film couldn't give you, namely sweat. And again, you know, up close <laughs> magic, like we were literally doing card tricks in front of you and tricking you, you know, like wow. Cirque du Soleil was great at that, you know, like mm -hmm. and tricking the eye and making, you know, and just doing amazing things like Stomp was great at it too. You know, we could take a matchbook and literally make a, a, a musical number out of it or whatever it would, but it was all very immediate and up close. And lots of shows came after that, including noise funk and um, De La Guarda and, um, and De La Guarda is, you know, very famous for the aerial rigging that they did and oh, yeah. changed, changed the way that flying was done on Broadway or in, in theater, period. And Lion King came along as well as a big show that was obviously backed by a huge company, um, Disney. And full disclosure, I work for Disney. Um, but, <laughs> but who doesn't? Yeah, who that's doesn't? true. Um, 
And so, yeah, so it was, um, it was you know what I'm saying, they own everything, but you, and good, good on them. Um, oh, yeah. But it was, it was pivotal, that moment, like going to experimental theater, not understanding it, getting this audition for Stomp, getting in Stomp, and then realizing that my training at experimental theater had prepped me a thousand percent for a career in wow. alternative theater. Yeah, in physical theater, like um, experimental theater, just like, and, <laughs> and I got into Stomp, and within a few months, I all of my training started to click. And then I started to swear by that training, um, that avant-garde, experimental, whatever you want to call it, off the beaten path, um, path, awesome training that we were getting there. And, um, and so, yeah, it's just, I just made a career in that, in that lane in physical theater and was doing that always creating shows. That was always a part of what I was doing. And then there was this little thing that was on my shoulder. It was kind of scratching me in the back and it was called the acting bug. And wow. uh, I always had it and I just could not escape it because my original love was acting. And, mm -hmm. you know, dance and music were honestly there before. I was playing drums since I was nine years old. And um, so I was always a drummer before anything. But acting was this dream. And I don't wow. know that I ever had a dream to be a drummer. I just was a drummer. I just always was a drummer. I was always a drummer. Um, but, but acting was this kind of, you know, I was in love with the, with the idea of it and the you know, I think I was in love with the celebrity of it as well, even though I didn't necessarily see myself as a famous actor. I didn't I didn't see that many representations like myself as famous actors. And so yeah. I don't know that I thought that I was going to be some hugely famous person. And indeed, I'm not yet. Not <laughs> not as an actor, but you know, as a director, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I just so I went out to L.A. I, I left Stomp and I went out to L.A. and I was like, let me... um let me see what I can do, you know, as an actor. And I had some guidelines for myself, for my career and what I wanted to accomplish. And um, some of them came true and others of them didn't. For example, I thought I would be an indie film actor. I really thought indie film was going to be the way wow. for me. I thought my I favorite. Would, thought, yeah, I thought that would be it. Um, that didn't happen. And I have reasons or I have um, theories as to why it didn't. Some of them do involve, you know, just who was producing indie films at that time. I thought they were a little yeah. bit more off the beaten path when in fact they weren't. They were casting pretty status quo. And we learned that, you know, with the Me Too movement. We learned Definitely. who was in charge of indie films and what was going on and why the casting was looking the way that it was when indie mm -hmm. films should have been alternative casting. Yeah. It should, you know, and yeah. I totally thought that market was going to be that. Instead, I ended up having a pretty commercial career out there. I got sucked into literal commercials at first, and uh, that became my day job. You know, suddenly mm. this look and being a drummer and being from Stomp and being a chick and, you know, I think being black also helped. And um, so I was booking every cool drumming kind of commercial for McDonald's. Wow. And, I mean, and I did all that stuff. And then you make a name for yourself in commercials. And it took me a while to kind of, grow into what my look was and what I was selling in Hollywood um, before I really started to book um, acting jobs and grew my hair out, my locks out, loved having my locks. And as soon as I grew my locks out, that's when I really started to, to book more work and, wow. and uh, went as far as I felt I could go as an actor. Um, there are so many better actresses and they frankly want it, want that lane more than I wanted that lane. And I was already, you know, one foot out of Hollywood and I was already directing and I, <laughs> and I was in film school and I was always doing all these weird physical shows and jumping around with acrobats and aerialists and stuff. And so I was always kind of um, going to leave the acting lane um, eventually anyway. And I'm quite happy with um, where things have landed for me in the acting lane. I'm very grateful for the projects that I've gotten to work on. And I'm not done yet. My manager still calls me. He's probably mad at me right now because I just I just had to walk away from something. But it's only because I'm in this directing lane and things are happening. Yeah. This lane and, and, and I feel like I have more to say as a director anyway. So. I really love that. I really love that you're doing what you, what you want to do. Um, yes. You know, that <clears throat> for what, what you're passionate for. Um, you're not letting anyone speak for you um, because nowadays it's like, you know, uh, we, we always hear about, you know, like Britney Spears, right? You know, the way right. control, you know, she right. couldn't do this and this. And 
But when it comes down to like actors, you know, everyone has, you know, agents, managers, publicists, and, you know, we have so many different people in your ear, but, yeah. uh, you know, you are your own person. And it's amazing. I, I want to applaud, first of all, that, you know, we recognize that and you recognize that as, as well. You're, you're your own person and you're doing what, you know, what you're passionate for because you don't really hear that much anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest myths in our business is the idea that somebody else is controlling your destiny. Yes. And yeah. I was, I was handed a certain set of cards, you know, to play in this game, like during my short, short period of time that I have to live here. And my cards um, looked like, you know, I was a black woman in America in a, this certain time period with this face this wow. personality and this ability. Those are the cards that I was dealt to play. And, you know, they are very different from the cards that you've been dealt to play. And mm -hmm. I looked at my deck and I said, and, and I looked at my deck versus what I wanted to do in my life. And I said, the two things don't really match up. You know, that no, no one is looking for me to be the next starlet or whatever. I mean, they just weren't. If, if anything, I yeah. was being discouraged from having a career and I certainly was being overlooked. And all of these things taught me that you're right, you know, Frack, it's like, th this is my life. And yeah. I, I wasn't considered in the cast list in a way that I thought was good for me. Like I was not satisfied with the way that Hollywood saw me in the early yeah. night. And, and as a result, I just said, okay, well, I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to straighten my hair. I'm not going to do anything <laughs> to my nose. I'm not going to lighten my skin. I'm, I'm going yeah. to go as far as I can go in this business as this individual. I will mold myself into characters as they come. Um, you know, and I'm not going to take any crap from anybody about my, you know, my choice because at the end of the day, you know, I've said this a, a number of times and I take a deep breath because it, it's just sort of it matters to me. But I but I don't want it to come off as, I guess, like cliche or preachy. But, you know, I, I, I am the only person that I go to bed with every night. I'm the last person before mm. I close my eyes and I have to be proud of who I am and the work I'm doing. And I'm still not always proud of who I am sure. and the work. You know what I mean? I make crazy mistakes and I look at work some in progress. Of, yeah. You know, um, but I am proud of what I was able to accomplish with my set of, um, I guess like parameters for how I was going to do my career. And I think I moved the needle forward from the women who came before me and just as the, the women who are coming after me, who are in my category, you see a lot more of us now than you did when I started, true. when I started now, now we're like kind of the it girls. And there's, there's <laughs> something that people have been like, are you crazy girl? You were on TV. You were in the, and you quit right as like dark skinned women became a thing. And to that, I say two things. One is I can't read the future and I had no clue what was, no. you know, I'm just living my life, you know? And secondly, I don't, I, I, I think I'm a director, you yeah. know, I think I'm a director who had a decent career as an actor and I'm so grateful for it. And I'll do some acting in the future. I'm down for it, you know, but I think I have so much more to say as a director. And so I never, you know, I do look at some of these young, young actors out there. You know, I look at Issa and I look at Lupita oh, yeah. and I, I mean, I just, I'm so, I'm just like, wow. Cause that's my lane. That's my category. Yeah. But I don't think that I have what they have and, and namely the desire to do what they're doing, you mm. know, and nobody has what Lupita has. I mean, she's, you know, she's a starlet. You know, she's, she's incredible. She yeah, is, she's my goodness, I admire her in yeah, every she's way. A starlet. She's a starlet. Absolutely. You know? um, but, you know, I think I'm just, again, proud of what I'm, what I've done and what I'm doing. And, and I'm super stoked about what they're doing and what they have. Mm -hmm. and, and I support all of them, you yeah. know, from D.R. Kilpatrick, who's a writer Mm -hmm. and and an actor and who's just killing it in that lane who's also in my category and you know I just all these great great people i have nothing but um respect and well wishes for them and i'm happy to be doing what i'm doing so so you you had said you know something you you said you don't 
you didn't have uh, the driver to, to do what they're doing. I, I would say different. I think you walked up against a bunch of barriers and you kicked the door down and kind of laid this path, you know, for people to follow. Um, my main question and, and what clicked in my mind was acting has to be one of the hardest jobs out there. I mean, you're, you're literally pretending at times to be somebody else. Uh, would, would you say that the was to be an actor, then kind of get behind the camera so you know what it's like? Yeah, it definitely helps. It definitely helps to to have had the experience on the other side. Empathy, I think, is probably the, the mm. most the major thing. It's like, you know, what the biggest lesson for me to learn as, as, as a director was that 50% of what we do is human psychology. And wow. I think when I first started working as a director, when I was really young, like 18, I was taking class, you know, like I said, experimental theater, we were taught all the ways to be creating stuff. So I've been doing it for a long time. But I think until I really got into the professional world, I thought that it was just about the work that you didn't bring the other stuff into the room. And if you wow. did, that was somehow a shortcoming and that, you know, we just need to stay focused on the work. And I would literally look at people and be like, what, what's going on? Like, why can't you just focus on the work? And that got beat out of me very quickly, very early on when the first actor says no. Mm. And, and, they're, and they're saying no because they feel unsafe. And they and un, and by unsafe, I don't think they think I'm gonna hurt them in any kind of like physical way. They feel unsafe emotionally. Yeah. And that if if I'm gonna ask them to love and to hate and to fight and to cry and to get all to have sex and what are all the different things that we ask them to recreate life on stage, then the least I could do is um, empathize with that position and like care more about the way they felt um, than, than I had done before. In fact, put it on par with, um, with like dramaturgy or blocking or any of mm -hmm. those things, like taking care of the actor's emotional life is, um, is incredibly important to me. And yes, I got that from not just from being an actor and knowing what it feels like to, you know, put your emotions on your sleeve like that for everyone to see, but also from actors saying no and you wow. have to listen to that otherwise you you cannot get anything done if, if the actor is saying no and so yeah man that's that, that there's so much truth to that you know i mean empathy that isn't that something that you know lacks kind of today in, in society is empathy like you know it, it's it's crazy Hmm. Yeah, it's like, I mean, you know, we go down that little philosophical wormhole for a second, you know, <laughs> I think empathy is is a fascinating concept, because in some ways, I feel like it's a really modern thing, like the last like couple thousand years, and that it that we have evolved to be empathetic when, you know, if because if you're looking at, you know, the animal kingdom, you know, um, I mean, they murder, you know, they be killing their you know, son that eat the that you know, the monkey will eat his kid or snatch yep. the baby, you know, like and it's we come from that, you know. Yep. And a lot of times to speak to your point, Frick, I think what I'm seeing is oftentimes a battle between the primitive brain, the instinctual brain, and the modern brain that's saying, wait, I don't have to hate. You know, for, let me give you an example. It's like, you know, the biggest example that we have is sort of racism, right? Or in-group, out-group kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So your, your evolutionary instinct is not to be empathetic. Your evolutionary mm. instinct is to move away from things that look different from you, to identify that rustle in the, bu in the bushes as a tiger or as an enemy, as opposed to like a friendly, because the, the chances of you walking up on, you know, something dangerous is high. So wow. your survival instinct makes it so that you stay away from things that are different, unusual, make weird sounds, all of it, things that are dark. So we're not actually that empathetic to things that are outside of our group. We, we are, empathy is something that we developed as a survival instinct inside of our group. So mm -hmm. now we cut to, you know, 10,000, 15,000, whatever it is years later, Math is not my specialty, but you know, whatever it is, <laughs> yeah, years yeah. later. I'm with you. I'm know, with you. Yeah. 
and we live in this modern melting pot. Here I am, a black woman talking to you two white guys. We're not from the same tribe, but we are. Mm -hmm. And our higher modern educated brain tells us that. Our Definitely. higher modern educated brain tells us that we are more alike than we are different. The science mm -hmm. of genetics tells us that, that, that there's more variation between you two white guys than there is between us. You know, that's just genetics. Mm -hmm. um, as counterintuitive as it sounds, that's just science. Um, you know, the modern brain tells you that I am not your enemy and that I'm not going to rob, blah, 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 like all the different things. Yeah. So we're actually working against our <laughs> natural instinct. And, and so for empathy to be hard to come by in this day and age is not surprising when people are using our primitive natures as a weapon to separate us. Isn't that what they're doing? It's just the yeah, base here. Are. You can't trust them. You can't trust those other people. And that's base. That goes mm -hmm. way beyond our modern educated brain. It hits you in the gut, in the heart. It does. So now it's like, okay, what am I doing? Is it, am I going to go with my gut feeling or am I going to go with this intellectual crap that all the, you know, the imp lovers are, are saying, <laughs> you know, love one another. It's all good. You know, you don't have to, <laughs> or am I going to go with that? And that's what we're up against. And, and so, yeah, there's a lack of empathy, but it's, 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 you know, because human beings are sometimes too easily played. Yeah. Yeah. I, but before we, before we get into the deep stuff, like that, this and Avengers, I, I want to stay on this real quick. <laughs> and, 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 and I also want to point out, I think that's why things like podcasts and, and, you know, where you're getting the, what I actually think and what he actually thinks and what you actually think versus I turned on the TV the other day just to see what was happening. And it was, you can't trust them and you can't trust them. And I hate them. And this is why I hate them. And I'm like, well, hold on. Where's the news though? Like what's <laughs> actually happening in the world? That's what I turned this on for anyways. Sorry. That's yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, I, I don't listen to the news at all. I am. I, I don't either. Fact, <laughs> I've been that way since I was a kid. I remember when I was like seven or eight years old, the way that they would just broadcast murder. Yeah. yeah. It used to just scare me when I was a kid. And it just would give me like, you know, palpitate. I would just get this like sick feeling oh, in the yeah. world, like murder. Everything was just like murder, murder, murder. And I used to just kind of leave the room when the news came on. It would just make me feel icky. And I think I've just always been that way. And so for me, I get my news from alternative sources, podcasts. And I try mm -hmm. and listen to a spattering of things, even people that I disagree with and they're difficult to listen to. Sometimes, yep. they, <laughs> whoo, sometimes they, whoo, they just, you know, they're talking some crap, but, you know, you try and listen to. And but as a result, I feel like I get the news from trusted sources. Yeah. But I but I stay away from the sensational headlines. And so a lot of times I'm catching up to the bloody news a week, two weeks later. Like I didn't even I didn't even know it happened, you know, because it didn't come into my feed like that, you know, into yeah. my brain feed. I just, I'm not getting that like blood like that every day. And so, and I do it on purpose. And now that, now that I'm this age, I realize I've been doing it since I was a little girl. I just have never liked wow. the sensational, uh, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing. I've, it's disturbing mm -hmm. to me. So. And, and, that, and that's probably why you remain such a humble, great, beautiful person too. You know, it's well, yet that hasn't been shoved down your throat your whole life. You know, like a lot of people, that's all they know. <clears throat> it's definitely polarizing, isn't it? And you get on, you get in and start listening. It's like, you know, it's anybody on that soapbox. And if you're listening to them and you're, you, you're not sure. And someone's standing on that box and they're saying, I'm sure then it's, it's easy. That's why I mean by humans are worse often easily played, you know, it's, yeah. it's very easy to, to get us going on a, on an idea. And before long, you know, a combination of momentum and pride stop you from getting off of that bad uh, idea. That's true. In your mind, you know, it's like, well, I'm already headed this way and my friends are this way and I'm not going to admit that I'm wrong. And so you just yeah. keep going, you know, and it's, you mix it <laughs> together and, and we end up in, in our separate corners. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know quite what to do about that other than to continue to make art, you know? Yeah. Like right, right now I'm on the road with the Lion King and um, 
the Lion King is an interesting project in that, like, um, it's the blackest show in the history of blackness. <laughs> uh, wait, 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 tell me more. Tell me more. What do you, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's set in Africa. It's got black leads in it. It's been running for 25 years. It's like, it's got a cast of like 50 black people. It's like the blackest yeah. show in the history of blackness. <laughs> when you're, you know, when you have the skill set to get into the Lion King, it's a dream for people oh, yeah. who sing that way or dance that way. It's a dream. And, you know, and, um, and we go out into these theaters, into these communities, you know, and Lion King sells out and it gets a standing ovation. And it is sometimes the irony is amazing to me that we don't see the people that are on the stage. It's like, those are the same people that in yes. some of these areas you're voting against their rights and you're voting, you know, and these are the people that you, you claim that you don't like or that you hate. Meanwhile, like, you know, people are just crying over Simba and crying over the bird ladies and the cheetah. And it's like, yeah, those are, you know, that's, oh, what am I trying to say? It's like, you know, it's the healing power of art. It's this kind of great equalizer in that it's a mirror to society and that if you're doing it right, it, it pierces the human soul and not just any one particular group. And so in a country that's incredibly racially divided, the biggest show is the blackest show in the history of blackness. Wow. It, it's like, yeah, it's just, it's amazing to me that we're performing for mostly white audiences all the time. And mm -hmm. I don't, you know, what's coming up in my mind right now, and I'm thinking about like all the black, you know, podcasters right now who'd be like, right, so is it a minstrel show, right? Like, hmm. let's look at the dark side of it. Is it that vaudevillian thing where it's just black bodies are on display for white entertainment and i don't think of it i i guess i'm just not that cynical yeah yeah instead what i tend to think is more that it would it is difficult to hate something that you are intimately connected with and the the way Definitely. that you know what I mean? Like if you know it and the, I, I think the gay community says this a lot, like this was a big strategy of the gay civil rights movement. Hey, I, my air, my AC just turned on. So let me know if it's too loud, but you good. Um, I'm good. <laughs> um, but it's like, they, they would always say something like, you know, it's hard to, everybody hates the, a gay person until your son is gay or something like it was like this kind of yeah, thing, right? you're yeah. a gay person in your family then you're more and i think i that's kind of how i think of it it's, i think these people we, we we have a chance to change their hearts and minds by showing them our talent by showing yeah. them this incredible story this human story about um life and you know death and redemption and courage and all things that all humans can relate to. And it is being told to them by a mostly black cast. And that is important. And I don't think that that should go over their heads. Like our ethnicity yeah. should not go over the audience's head because it's a part of the healing. Okay, I think I got the point <laughs> out. <laughs> no, no, I, I think another way to look at it is you're watching some of the best in the world yeah. do what they love to do. I mean, that's yeah. how that's how I've always looked at stuff like no matter who's on stage or who's on the TV or, you know, who who's running down a football field. I'm watching the best in the world do what they love to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. amazing. It's it's yeah. art. And it's yeah. important, too. It's it's important. It's important. It's an important give back that we that we artists are certainly giving back, you know, because um, we're public servants and we don't give it, yeah. we, you know, so we're like, a tap dance, give me some food, tap dance, give me some food. I mean, it's real basic, but it's important in terms of our um, balance as humans yeah. that we not only have a record of the day's events, which is really what theater is, it's just a record of the day's events, but mm -hmm. we also have a witness to the day's events, meaning mm -hmm. if no matter how good we were or how bad we were that there was a witness to it and that that gets put in our faces so that we can cry about it and laugh about it. And we have to be able to laugh at ourselves because if we, if we don't, we're doomed. If we, if we cannot laugh at ourselves, we are doomed. We are doomed. We are doomed. And if that, if it's, yeah, we're doomed if we can't laugh at ourselves. So. Yeah. I actually got to see the Lion King. Uh, me and Vicky had seen it in uh, new Orleans. Um, 
I'm going to say like three, three, maybe four years ago as well. And uh, I took a lot of things home with me that night uh, after watching it. Uh, I mean, I've seen the movie a million times. I can quote you yeah. from start to finish. But like, you know, seeing seeing such a production, uh, I mean, especially the the master, the mastery of, you know, what you guys were doing on that stage, you know, whether it was with the uh, the cheetahs with the sticks and everything. I'm not, you know, I've, I mean, we've been to, you know, I don't know, 50, 75 shows and I've never seen anything like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, like that is a, a mastery of art of creating something beautiful, you know, and, but it, you know, just thinking back on it with like Zazu where, where that uh, it was a, it was a, a guy running around, you know, and it was just like, I'm who yeah, does that? I mean so let's, different let's put that let's put that credit where that credit is due julie Taymor and michael mm. curry um the puppeteers and the puppet makers oh. but julie Tam julie Taymor had a vision for lion king that disney was able to support let's wow. let's call it what it is like she was brilliant she mm -hmm. is brilliant she was <laughs> making these killer puppets she had all these killer ideas disney gave her some money to sort of do some workshops of it and she hit it out of the park Wow. She hit it out. She hit I didn't know the story of that. Yeah. And she's, she's a genius. And so, uh, you know, so is her um, partner who helped design the puppets. And that was an, a, a, certainly an attraction for me in taking the job as resident director. All the Lion King shows have a director on board because it's just that type of machine where you have to Ooh, have yeah. a Julie Taymor on the ground, just making sure, you know, the show stays the show and Disney is very serious about its intellectual property, its IP. Oh, yes. And so, you know, <laughs> you have to keep that IP looking exactly the same. That, for example, in the film, there's a scene where the, the um, Timon and Pumbaa and Simba sing Hakuna Matata, and Pumbaa, uh, Simba, um, excuse me, Simba ages as they move, and then they're doing this certain little dance step against, yeah, against this like <laughs> silhouette. I'm going to tell you right now. We have to recreate that on stage. It's one of That's the right. iconic looks. And if it, it doesn't is. look like that, myself and the resident dance supervisor are taking care of it and making sure that it looks that way. Wow. Um, so yeah, it was it was a stroke of genius. It comes along, you know, every now and again. Here we are a generation later. It's 23, 24 years since Lion King. It's time for a new one. It's time for a new one. And Lion King, you know, I, I sometimes say it's the new Christmas Carol, and I and I believe it is. And you were Absolutely. saying you were saying that you hadn't seen anything like it. I would I would say yes, indeed, Julie <laughs> has made her mark. But I would say you have in that. Do you remember a Chris? Um, do you remember the Nutcracker? I'm not gonna lie to you. No, I no. do. I'm, well, I'm a little older. I'm a little <laughs> older. Yeah, I mean, but the nut the Nutcracker was that kind of thing, and we just now started not doing the Nutcracker in favor of the Lion King. You know, wow. but, but the Nutcracker was done. I mean, that ballet was done from before I was born up Same. until, you know, I mean, people are still doing it, but yeah. it was the Lion King. Christmas Carol is another show that's like, it's shockingly good. Like the story that's, that's going through Christmas Carol. That's why we've been doing it for 75 years. Lion King is the new that. And so, you know, and there'll be something else that comes along that hits us that thread like that, where it's just like, wow. You know, yeah. that human, that human thread, because that's what we do. We're awesome. We're humans. And um, yeah. And it's not, again, not to take anything away from Julie, because yeah, she's, yeah. she's, she's, she's a genius and mm -hmm. the work it shows there. And it, it, it's just that synergy. And you have, you know, Disney had this incredible story and Julie had these incredible puppets and Disney fought for what it fought for to have it in the show and have the show work a certain way. And Julie wow. fought for what she fought for to have the show work a certain way. And the things that Julie fought for um, are are some of the most amazing parts. The Lion King, for example, Nala is a much bigger character in the stage show. She is mm -hmm. fiercer. She's you know she's meant to be a bad mamma jamma in the show, and we like mm -hmm. her big and tall and fierce. And um, uh, Rafiki was changed into a woman. Because yes. um, Julie Julie wanted to really touch the South African culture of the Sangoma, which is wow. the, um, which is the spiritual um, per person, the liaison between our world and the and the world of the ancestors is is called a Sangoma, and that's what the Rafiki character is, and they are always women. So 
Julie fought for that wow. and got that. As a result of that, you you know, I just named two characters, Nala and Rafiki. Um, South African women for the past 23 years have had this goal. South African singers have been able to come over and play Rafiki and have these incredible lives over here in America. And only South African women can have that contract. You can have wow. other girls sub it, but only South African women or African women can have that contract. Julie did that. And that's yeah. amazing. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. And, and <sighs> Nala's part as well. Nala gave us, um, um, Heather, Heather Headley, you know, who went on to win the Tony for Aida and like, you know, she was the original Nala. I mean, it's like, come on, like, Julie, Julie did that, open those um, avenues for us. And so um, I'm definitely have, I have a lot of respect for her as an yeah. artist and what she accomplished. And I'm happy to walk just, just a small um, bit in her footsteps and be able to look after her show. But it's time for I'm me to awesome. move on. It's time for me to go do my <laughs> own thing. <laughs> oh. And we got we got we got to get some inside scoop on that after uh, after we we end this thing. But uh, a a good hard pivot here, right? We're going from something that is recreated year after year, and and things that we want to see a new version of as well, to something that I just don't think of, and something you're a part of, The Office. Talk us through yeah. being cast on The Office. Sure. Well, I um I was talking a little bit about my career. I was just plugging away as an actor, just doing my thing, plugging away, planning this career as a director, going to film school. And I got an audition for The Office and I did my homework just like any actor does. Got a call back on it, came in for the call back, um, did my homework and booked it. And then in retrospect, you find out, you know, that Craig Robinson was pretty instrumental in getting um, me on that show. We we're both musicians. Um, oh. <laughs> he was friends with um, some guys that I was in a band with and uh, he used to come to our shows, but I was the girl in the band and, you know, the boys, they want to be boys after the show and I wanted to be a girl. And so I went home and like, I did not hang out with the boys after the show. So I missed all the hangs with Craig. So I didn't really know him or know that he knew of me, but he did. And um, our chemistry was good and um, it was nerve wracking. And it was happening at a time when I was, um, you know, kind of moving my focus. I had already kind of started to shift into this other lane mentally. And so it was a surprise and it was great fun. And it was a little bit sort of gobsmacking and I was, <laughs> You know, kind of like, where am I and how this happened at this stage? I'm like, right now <laughs> this is happening? Like, I'm used to being the hardest working unknown person in L.A. Like, I knew everybody, you know, but nobody outside of L.A. really knew me. Like, I mean, unless you watch commercials, I was in your living room every day. But, <laughs> you know, it was like George Clooney was similar. It was like we were like, he, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, well, give me, give me a minute, but I, I, obviously I'm not as big as George Clooney, but he had a similar trajectory in that he had this career and, you know, everyone in town knew him and yep. then he booked ER and, and he was already like this, you know, and that's how I felt about the office. I was like, I already had this career in town. I worked all over town as a musician, as a choreographer, as an actor. And then I booked the office and it was like, oh, snap, this is like, you just kind of leveled up you just stepped into this yep. other kind of arena and i was doing some other guest stars and stuff so it was all starting to pop around that time and it was crazy and i i'm just i feel like i could not have asked for a better landing place for a quirky nerdy black girl from atlanta who <laughs> played drums and like to jump on things and it just was a it was a really good cast and crew to land in and i'm still friends with a number of the people on that show and i wish i was friends with more of them um Me but too. Yeah, it's just it was just a really really good place to land yeah for me I, I would definitely say we're we're huge office fans um and i think that's how i'd say uh, matt and i uh first had uh, gotten to to see you on screen um, but like the office is like life changing to us. Like, you know, I, I still watch it every night. Uh, you know, I've been watching it since I was, I think, um, I don't know, maybe 16, 17 is when I started and every single night, every day I'm watching the office and 
I can quote you most episodes. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you better than me. Don't, don't quiz me, man. Don't quiz me. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, never mind. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Let me, so, let me stay hold. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's, yeah, it's amazing how popular it is and how respected. And I know, especially people, now. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I got to say, man, you know, for somebody who had the bug like I did and who wanted to make an impact, but also, but wasn't in Issa Rae and I didn't have that. I yeah. am so grateful for the office and the fact that I, that I got that little, you know, that little stamp in there and I'm just oh, like, yeah. this is great. And, you know, I got, I got in a Marvel movie as a, as a character in my, in my old ass, you know, out there trying <laughs> to twirl my stick and, you know, hey. and I, just, I had been out of martial arts training for probably like a year or two when I when I started auditioning for the Marvel stuff. And I'm like 20 years older than those girls, you know, so I'm just like really happy that I was able to even get in there. And, you know, like I said, the the, the day is long and, yeah. you know, I know those casting directors and you never know what will happen in the future. I'm not. um <laughs> <laughs> turning my back on any acting work that's but uh, I really feel like what I have to say as a director I mean I hope I make you guys proud in that way and I surprise yeah. you in that way when you when you when you get to see my work as it's coming out so it's it's really it's really amazing to to see that transition because like I said we we we've known you as Val you know our entire our, our entire lives pretty much <laughs> you know it's the funniest or half half of our life but like you know, um, it's always amazing seeing uh, someone go a different direction in their life. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people are chastised for, you know, instead of going left, they decide to go right. And it's just right. the wrong thing to everybody. I, I hear it all the time because when I was taking these trips for years, people were like, you're going to die. You know, <laughs> uh, like they said, you're not going to survive out there. It's a horrible place. And let me tell you, because I took those steps. You know, I, I had a I had a wonderful few years, uh, you know, and, and I still have a, a, an amazing life. But with COVID and all, you know, traveling, it's kind of condensed. But, uh, you know, because I took that step and I didn't listen to these people, you know, or haters, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it changed my life. It changed my life completely. And that's and that's how I feel about you as well. Like just watching you go from and I know you started in so many things, but like just go from vow to hey, I'm going to be a director now as Amina Kaplan. You know, like that's, it's exciting. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, man. You know, because it is really that. I'm just trying to have fun, honestly. I'm yeah. trying to make myself happy. <laughs> like I'm trying to fulfill my dreams, which are to direct awesome stuff. And like, you know, and it's, I'm, I really am about that fun and that freedom. Like those, that's like a big part of it to me is that, is that I'm enjoying myself. And um, I really enjoy live entertainment. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. Just that audience interaction, that immediacy like that. And, you know, I mean, I get to watch a lot of Lion Kings as you, as you might well imagine. <laughs> so and jealous. <laughs> it is still so much fun, like to see yeah. the audience, the way that they, you know, feel about the show and creating shows is fun. I got musicals in the works right now. I'm developing shows. And so like, I, I just, I just want to have a blast, you know, and that's, that's a large part of what motivates me and artistic freedom does as well, you know, and, oh, yeah. and being able to kind of dress the way I want and, and look the way I want, you know, Hollywood, man, they, that's taxing. It's hard uh, to be a TV I know. actor, you know, the hair and makeup and everything. <laughs> and I just get to be raw Amina right now. And you guys, Hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with raw Amina. There's I'm absolutely chilling. nothing wrong with I'm you, chilling. man. I'm chilling right now. Yeah. It was, just like it was there's just a lot more to acting um than i wanted to participate in there were, i was just interested in other stuff like i just wanted to climb things and play my drums and go camping and just i just want to do it i want to swim you know i just want to yeah. do some other stuff you know and it's That's hard right. to put dreadlocks on because you've <laughs> seen that episode of the office <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome man for the record i had my hair put up in a bun up top because that's how you swim with locks on and they were like that's Come not on. sexy so they were like take it down <laughs> 
and little did they know, like your dreads get waterlogged, you know, yeah. and they start to pull you down, you know, if your hair oh. is down. And so, oh my God, like, and that pool was heated too. It's like, so it's, uh, it's just a horrible experience. But that was such a great episode though. Yeah. It's fun. It was, yeah. oh, it was great. We had a blast shooting that episode. It was I mean, just um, difficult. I mean, you got to work with one of the greats, which I'll just bring that up. Uh, but, uh, you know, like James Spader. Uh, look, I'm a big Blacklist fan. I'm a big Spader fan since I started watching him and, you know, uh, you know, Pretty in Pink. I mean, come on, man. We got to take it back. We got to yeah. take it back. Pretty in Pink. I, I'm all telling the, you. Spader's in all those movies. He's in all he those is. movies. He's in everything. And, yeah. And that's been my dude since I was a little girl. Like, oh, you know, yeah. now it's, I think like, you know, I could say I probably had a crush on him, but probably not till I was in my like later teens like 14 15 or something because mm -hmm. you know because he was always the bad guy he was always like yep. lady. He, was he was a good always, looking you know, guy he, but he was always bad he was just that <laughs> little attitude and that hair he just had that crazy <laughs> hair i just be like he is just a snob you know like he just <laughs> i just love and he was always the best actor james spader was always the best actor and my oh. goodness he did he did he was in lessons he was in all that he was in everything that, that everyone was in james spader was in That's and then right. he did that movie Sex Lies and Videotape. And yes. that was that was when I was like, okay, my man has just crossed over from the teeny bopper. Yeah. And he just <laughs> yep. went, he's gonna be, he's gonna be the man. And he is, and he was he's amazing. And you know, I didn't spend that much time with him. I think mm -hmm. I was probably a bit starstruck and he was having his own journey with the office. And so oh, you, know, yeah. you, you give people their space or whatever. Um, but every day it was just like, oh my God. Yeah, that's, that's James him. Spader. <laughs> that's James Spader. That, yeah, and he's like, he's not that like mainstream guy. He's not no. that like, you know, he he's he's quirky and interesting and mm -hmm. kind of off the. And he just he was always the man. And you look back on his career and you're like, yeah, he was he was. Oh the yeah, man. yeah. He was and the I man. mean, you know, just as Robert California, like my favorite scene ever. Well, favorite one of my favorite episodes in general is the Halloween episode when he puts everybody's <laughs> story together yeah. and he creates this crazy, bizarre five minute thing at the end. And it's just like the punchline is just like, what? <laughs> yeah. You know, but he's, yeah. he is a genius. I'm a, I've am been a fan of his and I watch Blacklist every single week. Uh, you know, it's, my dad is just, you know, he kind of um, introduced me to Spader, I think in Boston legal, uh, okay. you know, yeah, but like, mm -hmm stuff like that but like you know when when he was in the office I'm, I'm not even joking for years i didn't know it was him he <laughs> does look a lot different doesn't he from when he was a kid yeah he's gone through a major transformation but you know people just you, people look different yeah you know yeah he um yeah he's uh he's he i forgot what i was gonna say he's like Oh, I forgot. I, forgot. I lost my train of thought. On, but just, I was he's just, just the another... best. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. He. Oh, I was gonna say that my boyfriend watches Blacklist, but I, uh. I, I haven't gotten into it too, too much. There oh. is definitely a part of me. There's. I know it's bad. <laughs> I've never seen it either. Confession, right now. There's a part of me that like wants him to be James Spader from when he was really young and he was all cute with that crazy <laughs> hair. Uh. His hair used to just be like. <laughs> and, it's crazy. He's just not that guy anymore, and I just have to get over it. Teenage me no. has to get over the fact that he's not. <laughs> he's James bald Spader. now, and yeah, you know, yeah. uh, which that was a. By the way, uh, I don't know if you know this, but like when season one hit, you know that was a very very big thing for James Spader to be bald, because uh, mm. he had never been like na natural. Well, you know, he never shaved off his hair completely, and I remember when season one happened uh, for episode uh, season one episode one. Uh, it was that was the, the highlight was Jane Spader cut, you know, shaves his head yeah. and becomes Raymond Reddington. Yeah. You know, it was a very big he thing because he was known for the locks. Yeah. And he know? gave himself a third chapter in his career. You know he, what I mean? He had that crazy, early, but he did boy. And then he had that middle chapter where he was the indie film guy. And what's it going to be? Yeah. And he did Boston legal. And now he's got this whole other chapter. You know, so he's pretty, he's, he's amazing in that way. Yeah. I mean, people, you know, people go through changes. I'm going through changes and oh, yeah. I'm happy with the ones, even though I feel like right now I'm rocking the look that I rocked when I was like 19, but like, yeah, yeah. but like, um, but still, you know, you, you go, you evolve and you become something different and he evolved into a completely different cool. look. Yeah. 
And it's, it's working for him. Obviously. And character. Yeah. You know, like every, I mean, he never played the same character twice. He never did that. But like, it's like every few years he became a character uh, person in general. Uh, yes. But that's just an actor. Uh, you know, he, he really does put everything forward and uh, mm -hmm. it's incredible to watch him even today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. All right, fine. I'll check out Blacklist. You, that's a shame you haven't seen it. You know, there's so much content right now. I got. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I got so 17 content. shows a week. <laughs> and I'm trying to. I'm trying to get up with these podcasts because these podcasts have saved me through so many things. So wow. I'm a loyal listener to, you know, a certain. We're honored. <laughs> yeah, I love pod. That was. That's why I agreed. I was like, freaking frack. Who is that? Oh, they do a podcast. <laughs> Bet. <laughs> we, we, you have no idea how like you know honored and and uh you know we feel like it's a privilege because you know we started this podcast a year and a half ago uh just talking about boy bands right and then it expanded into the, about the 90s and then it expanded about the early 2000s and 2000s and uh you know like just looking back because we're on episode 69 now like you know, we were just talking about it. Like our first guest was like episode 25. Yeah. And it seems like it was six weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> that's what happens when you're on the train and you're riding something good, you know, and it yeah. feels, it's great. It's like, I've, I've had that experience with shows, you know, where you're on something and it feels good. And so ride it, enjoy it, you know, like oh, don't yeah. question it too much, just enjoy it. Cause nothing lasts forever. And, you mm -hmm. know, Although, you know, Larry King, how, how long was he on the air of the show? You know, yeah. that gives us hope. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It might last forever, gentlemen. It might. Yeah. It might I mean, it's, it's not work for us. You know, it's an opportunity to like, like for you to, to have you on to tell your story. Personally, I feel like I've taken a master's class today for acting. Um, yeah, that was great. <laughs> that's how I feel right now. I feel like I might. Well, no, I, I've had the I've had the acting bug a while back and I, <laughs> I did some background work and watch directors get stressed out because they're 12, 15 days behind schedule. And yeah. I don't really you know, after that, I was like, I'm good. It's, you a, know? it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. So I, I offer this to you. Um, I don't know. Maybe you already do it, but um, mm -hmm. watch a movie and only watch the background actors. Watch something that you've seen. I do before. that <laughs> yeah. a lot. And only watch the honey they are some sometimes they just crack me up <laughs> just crack me up the ones the, the, the best ones are the ones who know what they're doing and you can yeah. you check them like at right i mean as that camera passes they are ready wow. with that sip they are ready with that expression they are ready i just love background actors i love them i love me them. too so they, it is highly entertaining to watch a movie and only watch the background actors. I'm gonna oh, do especially that. like Walking Dead with the zombies. Oh yeah. You you ever if you ever watch them, you would see like so many like incorrect consistencies because it's like, awesome. but it's it's difficult when you're like doing you know uh, like a herd of zombies right like in a field yeah. and, and you see like they're all doing this and one guy's going to the left for some reason and he's just <laughs> walking normally like this and I'm like. Is that a cast, like a, a crew member? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the best. It's the, everybody's trying to get their little moment. And you yeah. got you to gotta love it. You got to respect it. And, you know, or, or they're just doing a really good job. You yep. know, they're really helping the scene. Or they're being hilarious back there. <laughs> you know, they're just doing some stuff that just has me just rolling. They're just like, you know, because you know they just timed it perfectly to when the camera was coming across and just the effort you know, just 100%. cracking me up. Yeah, yeah, they're the best. They're the best. Yeah. Amina, these uh, yep. these hours go by so fast, so fast. Especially when we have some somebody on that you just want to have a conversation with. You just you know, don't want to let this, go. That's how all this started. <laughs> this all started by just telling stories. You know, we 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 had people on from all over the world, literally, just telling their stories. And you have an incredible one. And with that. I want to ask you what what's next what's coming up next that you can tell the people about where can we find you yeah well i'm still going to be a director i'm still going to be inside the disney family i'm going to be working on a new star wars fully immersive project oh, and wow. uh oh. yes and i think there's more released in the press than that but i'm not going to say nothing more than that i'm just going to let you know wow. disney imagineering say more than that but yes it is a fully immersive Star Wars project. 
Caleb's Caleb's hyped, man. That's that's that's, <laughs> yeah. that, that's the future, right? I'll have to there, go do some you know? digging. <laughs> it is the future for sure. Um, and is it this VR? Um, <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Boom. Boom. That's my life, by the way. VR just. I'm ready for that. I'm ready for that. And yeah, and so this is an opportunity for me to do, you know, like I said, I've been in physical theater, yeah, for which is like very, you know, analog physical theater. Yep. Is very Lion King is all hand pulled. It's puppets. It's stomp. Mm -hmm. It's you know this. You know, Blue Man Group is blah blah blah, and circus, no animals, and um, and this is um, I'm super interested in technology, and this is uh, this is that project. So. I'm going to go and wow. dip all the way in, dive in both feet, both hands, full body immersion, and just like get those skills, you know, get those skills. Hey, get, get, yeah. get some things under your belt, get some credits. And yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I'm, that's really, that sounds really, really awesome. I'm excited because as soon as I find out, I'll message you <laughs> with, with my excitement messages that I send yeah. random people a lot. <laughs> Let me know. Let me know. Yeah. So it, I, it, I'll be able to put it up pretty soon. I, I, cool. It's a couple of weeks. I I start next week, and then once I know what I can say, I'll 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 make Perfect. an announcement or put it on my whatever. My title will change from <laughs> resident director to director of something else. So director of the Republic. <laughs> when, that, hey, when that when that drops, when that drops, and and everything goes online, let us know. You know, we'll uh, do yeah. everything we can to help you out, and you know, even if you pop on for a for a you know, one minute video or something, you know, and we'll blast it everywhere for you. Maybe as well. in cool. costume. Yeah. Let me get yeah. in there and I'm going to, I'm going to, I have some ideas about how to announce. And so Perfect. I got to yeah. make sure it's, but you know, Disney, like, you know, the <laughs> IP, like, yep. We, we know, trust us. Uh, change that <laughs> font color. Change that. Change the here. Yeah. yeah. Don't get me in trouble out here. Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> we would not dare. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this, this was great. We can't thank you enough. Uh, what, what a perfect way to spend, you know, somebody's day listening to your story to, to help uh, get them through the day. So we can't thank you enough. And, and thanks for being on the show with us. It is my pleasure, gentlemen. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. And good luck with your podcast. This is an awesome format. So keep it up. This is what we need. It's yes. Grassroots journalism is what we need. It's definitely, you know, we're, we're all about that. Uh, not the same typical 10 minute, you know, asking the same questions and hearing the five minute e true, true Hollywood story about people's <laughs> lives. We always ask honesty, like we had talked about before, you know, like honesty is very, very important. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's been, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, I will say I will miss you, you know, as a guest, I will absolutely miss. Well, you, know, you can you have me here. back when the next project <laughs> takes hold. Every project. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Freaking frag get first dibs. There we go. Ooh. Find that Disney exclusive deal. We're in. Yeah. That's right. Let, let me know if you're ever in New Orleans, Amina. Oh, you know, I'm bummed out because I would love to be there, but I'm but I'm leaving the tour, so I'm not gonna go get to go. But wah, wah, wah. I forgive you. Yeah. <laughs> But awesome. I but I want to do a show about Second Line though. I've been like wanting to do it, you know. Ooh, yeah, that'd um, be awesome. I wrote a show about Second Lining, so we'll see if I get to do it. Come on, yeah, <laughs> these people will welcome you here. <laughs> yeah, I love new. I love it, but we'll we'll see if I get to do it. But uh, anyway, yeah. that's another shh project. She wasn't supposed to say nothing. <laughs> well, come on, and we'll do another episode about that. Let's go. Definitely. Yep. All right, All right, ladies guys. and gentlemen, we appreciate you guys. This is episode 69, podcast for the fans, by the fans. Peace. Whoa, it's the freaking Frack Show, a podcast for the fans, by this the fans. This is the freaking Frack Show, a podcast for the fans.